Welcome to Wednesday Live. Well, not live because we recorded this ahead of time because it's the day before Thanksgiving today. Our guest is retired Navy SEAL Master Chief Steve Drum. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thank you, Shannon. It's great to connect with you. It's great to see you. It's great to uh, be on your show. So thank uh, you very much. Thank you. And thank you for your service, Steve. Our whole month of November, we're dedicated to our veterans. And I'm thrilled that you're here and so grateful for your service. Thank you. I appreciate that, Shannon. So during your 27 years of service, you developed and led high performance teams in combat at every level and in the most challenging and extreme environments. You trained and led US and foreign partner special operations forces on high risk and strategically vital missions across the globe, including combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you co-developed and taught warrior toughness training for the US Navy. And this vital program is instrumental in building tougher and more resilient Navy sailors and officers. And you're a speaker and you're a consultant and you're just an awesome human being and I can't wait to learn from you today. Thank you, Shannon, great introduction. Yes, so tell me about how you have seen generosity at work as a Navy SEAL. What are ways that you have witnessed generosity? Well, I always just a story stands out to me. Um, you know, you, you make it through Navy SEAL training, BUDS, basic underwater demolition SEAL training, which is the uh, six month assessment and selection process before you go on to your follow on training. And so when you finally do show up at a SEAL team, you know, it's not necessarily the most uh, warm and inviting or hospitable uh, environment for, for a new guy or new meat, as, you, as you're referred to. Uh, and, and that's what they call you, right? Hey, yeah. meat is, is typically- As soon as you get in there, you're new meat. Yeah, nobody, you made it through some hard training, but so by, has everybody else there and nobody cares. And like, if you don't show up there with your, with your mouth shut and your ears open and demonstrate a humble and willing to learn attitude, then you're going to be in for a rough go of things. But nonetheless, uh, you know, you show up there and it's not always like, you know, it's not like necessarily that, that feeling of inclusivity. Like you're like, all right, I'm part of the team. I'm part of the family. You, you still have everything to prove. But sometimes, you know, the, the, and it makes sense, right? Because you need people to be humble, right? You need yeah. people to like, to really pick up the important lessons, but from those that have the experience, but sometimes, you know, at least for me, for many of us uh, during my, my peers, my new, my new meet peers, you find yourself kind of like retreating a little bit, like, Harry, I just want to, I want to, I want to go through the day and, and be messed with as little as possible. Right. Right. So you would like kind of sneak move quickly. There'd be like the training area where all the old guys would hang out, uh, like the offices for that ran all the training cells and departments. And you try to kind of move past that as quick as you could. And one day I'm moving past and, and I hear this, Hey, me, you know, and I'm like, uh Oh, I just stop, you know, and I turn around and it's this guy with this like intense looking glare, big curly red hair. He's like, come with me. And I'm like, Oh man. And I'm like, fine. And I come with him and he takes me back to his office and he closes the door He's looking at me and he's like, all right. And his glitter, he kind of softens and he's like, all right, you're going to come with me today. I'm going to teach you some stuff. And so I realized it. And so many times before that, it had been about, you know, all right, I'm going to help this guy do his like heavy lifting. Right. Yeah. But for me, it, it suddenly became apparent. This guy was like, his whole purpose was to train me was to teach me something was to kind of bring me into the team. And so that's what we did. We set up a compass course, but this late, this guy later, my first platoon, our first little uh, team that we put together, he came in later uh -huh. and he was always doing something like that with me and the other new guys. Like we, he would teach us how to customize or rig our gear. He would teach me how to like, uh, cause we fly in these cargo planes all the time, how to, how to rig up a hammock. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and he was just always there. And I was like, all right, I see this is how, like, this is how I want to model my behavior from. You know, and so he, he became, you know, a, a really good friend. Uh, and uh, he, sadly, he was killed in uh, Afghanistan, the first seal to die in, in, in 2000, uh, 2002. But, 
you know, like it's always kind of stay, stayed with me. And I, and I try to model that right like during my leadership is to, is to, Hey, you know, and I haven't always done it well. Right. I haven't always, you know, I've been yeah. a joke to people sometimes, right. To try to be hard on them. Cause I felt like that was the thing to do. But as I matured, as I grew, I started to remember those lessons and to say, Hey, let, let, let's demonstrate like what you're willing to do for somebody to yeah. make sure that they get in a lot of cases it's uh it's not necessarily the things like what he did in terms of like show me how to work my gear but it's also like hey this guy's performing well let mm -hmm. me make sure that while everybody is out doing like you know home for the day i'm gonna mm -hmm. sit there i'm gonna spend extra time like submitting him for an award so he can get recognized uh, you know, like the like sailor of the year, um, that was like a big thing. And so that's a way to like recognize, to give back, just to say, Hey, you know, the organization, it's not about me, but the organization will take care of you. Yeah. Right. So you learned from him to invest your discretionary time. If, if that's an accurate way to describe it in investing in others or recognizing others, filling out the the, you know, the person of the year, the sailor that you could really just, you know, acknowledge. For sure. And those are things that we look for, those qualities, you know, in terms of, uh, of kind of service, of stepping, stepping up and doing the right thing. And, you know, I remember like one of the last jobs I had in the Navy before I retired was to oversee the program that ran uh, the onboarding for new candidates, recruits that came in. Uh, to be uh, SEALs and air rescue swimmers and divers. And, and some of these kids, I call them kids, right? Young adults, uh, men and women, young men and women, they would like, they if they had some kind of medical issue or something in the record that, that caused them to be held behind, we'd, we'd have them work at the pool, right? To kind of support us, to help us run some workouts and, you know, take notes and all that kind of stuff. And and I remember one afternoon, I'm sitting in my car, like uh, on a call, and I see these guys are coming in from a workout and behind them is is some of the people that you like the janitorial services and you know a lot of them they have they have some disability sometimes right mm -hmm. and i see this this guy one of the, the janitor guys you know he's got a huge bag of trash and it just like breaks open and the trash goes everywhere and as the last guy like turns around and he looks and sees what happens but keeps going and I'm like, mm -hmm. and then like five seconds later, I see the rest of them come out and help him pick up all the trash mm -hmm. and do all that, right? To, to, to humble themselves, to kind of do, yeah. what, do what's right, right? And those are the kind of things that we look for, right? And, 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 you know, when you have new guys or, you know, something like that, who's going to take the initiative and be the first guy that's going to go over there and empty the trash can, right? It's not really something we do in the in business world, but those, the, those little things are what we look at. Like who takes that initiative, who does for the person to the left and right of them? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, like without that, like you're not going to be a part of a, of a winning high performing team. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. So what is the name of the gentleman who died in Afghanistan? Neil Roberts. Neil Roberts. And what do you think Neil Roberts saw in you that made him want to invest in you? If you could, imagine, or maybe he told you. I don't know uh, whether it was personal, but mm -hmm. I know that when he was a new guy, like he got harassed, like, like he, you know, cause there's, there's, there was hazing uh, and sometimes it would be bad. And I think he got a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And unlike the abused child syndrome, he chose to make sure that he took a distinctly different path and mm -hmm. how he mentored us, us young guys. Yeah. So I don't know, because it, 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 it wasn't just me. I, I think we became friends. Like he, he mm -hmm. took like, uh, because I made him laugh. Yeah. Uh, and so he kind of maybe took a, a little bit more of a shine and we kind of bonded. Um, but he did it for all the new guys. He was like, that's just how he was as a person. Yeah. He was, he was loved. He was revered. Um, that's so. a great example, Steve, because, you know, you think of a Navy SEAL as somebody who's, uh, especially those training you and leading you as people that are just breaking you down and t making you tough. And so you're saying like, yes, and like he made us tough and he cared about us and invested in us and made us feel worthy and loved. And he held us to a standard as well. 
It wasn't just like he was some big goofy teddy bear. Like, right. I mean, he, he would like, if we were screwing up, he would definitely let us know it. Right. I mean, we're, it, it, through like the, the last part of our platoon, uh, our, our deployment. Right. I mean, he took us all new guys together and said, Hey, you're starting to slack off a little bit. You're getting a little too comfortable. You're still new guys until the wheels uh, of that aircraft touched down on the runway after your first deployment back home. He's like, you're still new guys. You better, you better keep, staying humble and doing the right things and make sure stuff gets done. And, yeah. like, and, and it was just like, it was like, we just disappointed dad. Yeah. Right. It wasn't like he yelled at us and we were, it was like, Oh man, like I felt like disappointed that I had like disappointed him. Right. Yeah. So, Cause he had earned your respect. And part of, it sounds like how he earned your respect is by doing these other things, this other ways of generosity. What are, what are other examples that you have experienced as a Navy SEAL with generosity? You know, I, I tell you what, there's this, like, uh, and I just was remembering this, I was talking to my wife about this uh, like, like a couple of days ago. When we, I was doing some training, I was running training down in this place we go in the middle of nowhere in the Southern United States. We do a, a lot of assault training and we work, uh, so it's, it's, you know, close quarter combat guys run through doors really fast, shoot really close to one another. And then as they do it in a, a huge maze like structure, there's explosions going out on the hallway. It's we use explosions, uh, explosive breaching charges to go into the door. And, and some of these charges are packed with like, uh, you know, steel belted rubber. And so I mean, at one time I came around the corner and I was, uh, and one of these charges went off and I was like safely out of the blast area which is like the explosive overpressure that can hurt you like your brain and your, your cavities and stuff like that. But uh, I got hit by some of this like belted rubber going off at like 3,700 feet per second. And it fractured my jaw. It like uh, it, it, it splintered like my chin right there. And I had surgery and I was like in the hospital. I was in the hospital after I got uh, rushed to the ER and, and one of my teammates, uh, he was there. He just stayed with me all night. And then like he, my, my wife wanted to come down. She wanted to fly my mother-in-law down. Right. And he decided he was just going to take all the points from his credit card and just book them flights just all on his own and get it taken care of without consulting anybody mm -hmm. and like brought them in and picked them up and just without being prompted or just took wow. care of us. And, yeah. you know, guys are, you know, not every guy guys will do things like that, but not every guy will always go above and beyond. And, mm -hmm. and he did. And I, you know, we didn't, we didn't ever forget it. So. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, that That's like really paying attention to the needs of others, like on a personal level. Cause I'm sure you're trained to be cognizant of the needs of others when you're in battle or in, in a really tough situation. I'd love to hear more about that, but this sounds like he, he knew what you needed personally and took it upon himself to make that happen. Yeah. And he's getting, he's, uh, he's getting ready to come up and retire and it'll be 30 years of service for him. And he's gonna, and he wants to continue to serve, to give back to, to veterans, wounded veterans. And so he's working in, in a way to, uh, to do the nonprofit space and that's what he's yeah. going to do. Uh, and so he's not going to do it obviously for the money he's doing. That's just the type of person he for is. Service. Yeah. For service as always. Right. So as a master chief, you know, you were responsible for a lot of people and you also created training that has been it's used still from what I understand for the warrior toughness. Um, what, what aspects of that training or your own experiences as a leader, um, include the awareness of and responsibility for your you know fellow seals well you know i always looked at you know i i loved my time in the military and i i to be honest i, I loved my contribution in removing the enemy from the battlefield right mm -hmm. to direct action capacity but you know if i look back and i say all right well my biggest contribution, the thing that I am probably the most proud of, it's the training and development, right? And for, for the part I had, and and, and, I, and again, I, I didn't always do it right, uh, perfectly, but for those that I saw that, like, I felt like I had a hand in getting them advanced and mm -hmm. seeing them flourish as leaders on their own, you know, those are the things that I can look back at proudly. Uh, you know, when I developed the 
the Naval, uh, the, the warrior toughness program for the Navy, you know, a lot of that, you know, the part that I developed was the framework and, and the chaplains that we worked with would actually teach character development components. And so when I work with organizations today, though, a lot of things that, that I teach, you know, are when you're in that moment, like where it's like that high stakes or when you want to be effective is to always make sure that you're taking a beat, you're taking a pause, you're stepping back and you're having that time for that, like really quick assessment of what's going on, that situational awareness and that focus mm -hmm. to make sure that, because a lot of times we get into these situations and we have, you know, our pre-planned agendas, exactly what we want this person to, to have, what we want to give them, what we want to tell them. Uh, but sometimes we fail to really capitalize on what that person needs, mm -hmm. right? We have what we're prepared to show up with yeah. But we fail to let the situation inform us of actually the best way that we can be of service. And so what I like to impart is for uh, situations like that is for you to be, be more reflective and observant, to mm -hmm. stop and look around and say, okay, how can I best influence this situation in the positive, mm -hmm. right? Even if it's something I hadn't initially walked through the door wanting to do. Yeah. What I'm hearing you say there, Steve, is that it's not about you, right? Because I think if you're led by your ego, then what you want to do is show, how smart you are, how capable you are or something. What I'm, what I heard from what you just said is to be present, to be receptive, to take a beat, to kind of soak it in, to be curious, right? Which is more of a, a generous, inclusive, let's co-create this together kind of a thing. Well, I, I tell you, you know, one of the, the very first lessons when you show up at the BUDS training like almost the very first thing you hear out of their mouth is you're not going to make it through this training by yourself. For those of you, few of you that graduate the program and go on to the SEAL teams, you won't go on to do good, great things on your own, right? Yeah. You have to be about the people to the left and right of you. You have to do it as a team. You have to be able to lean in uh, to these relationships for, for you to be successful. And I, I guess, you know, the humility part, you know, I look at, it's hard to, to look around me and not see people that, that I feel are, are so much more capable and, and like extreme operators and, and lead with such, uh, you know, great character. It's, it's hard for me not to be humbled in their presence. Sure. So that's what I always, I always don't have to look far to see peers of mine that I really respect. And I'm like, yeah, man, they're doing great stuff. Uh, yeah. Let me just try to take a page out of their book. And so mm -hmm. I, that's kind of how I've always kind of looked at a lot of things. And that's just me being, being fortunate to be in such a community be surrounded by such great people. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I see that in you and how you operate, you know, you are very humble being as accomplished as you are. And one of your best attributes is your interest in, and the way that you bring out goodness in other people, like bring out their strengths. So I think that's awesome. And, and how you learned so early on in your SEALs training that you will not get through this on your own. I mean, what a great, important message for us to think about every day <laughs> is that we're not going to get through this on our own, right? I mean, even now during lockdown, there's like the only way that we stay sane is by having connections like this and, you know, staying close to our friends and our family, because I think we're communal creatures. We are. And that's, I think, you know, when you and I first met, you know, at Heroic Public Speaking, you, you know, I feel like that was such a special community because it couldn't have been any more different than the community I left in the military. But there still was that aspect of do for the people to the left and right of you. And I've been a such, you know, I've been such a big beneficiary of so many people like yourself, right? Just exceedingly generous people. Uh, never want anything in return, but to just offer what they can do to help, you know, get somebody a, a little closer to their goals. And so I, again, I'm very fortunate to have that aspect in my life. And I, you know, I, I learned from my wife too. I, I know one of the times when she left a job because it just wasn't going where she, she had wanted it to go and she didn't have a job. She was looking for a job but I was just kind of really taken aback by how much time she spent trying to get other people jobs <laughs> too. <laughs> Why she tried to leverage her connections to yeah. get all the people that you knew. Some were her friends, some were people that she didn't know really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just like, I took a lesson from that. And, and so I was, I was always very impressed and, and yeah. very much respect her for that. 
Right. So she knew like one of the assets she had was a network and probably influence and experience and she wanted to help people. So she used some of her, you know, resources or call it like, you know, what you have to give anybody. It's like your, your stash. Well, yeah. And, and, and those, she didn't do it for, for this. Surprisingly enough, as the years go by, that stuff has come around back to her as well. Mm-hmm. Like, and she's known as the person that will, will network. She's known as the person that will, will, will help you. And, and yeah. people of course will, will be reciprocal with that. And I think that's like, if, if you as a leader of an organization can make that your cultural norm, can model that behavior, can model like initiative, can model humility, can model like, Hey, I'm going to like roll up my sleeves and do some heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. men and women that that work uh, under me yeah. uh, uh, then you know I, I'm a part of of creating that culture of people that will do for one another yeah oh that's great I think that's awesome and I love how you observe that in her and how you took a page out of that book and said you know I want to be more like that and you see and I also appreciate what you're saying about the reciprocity of it how it comes back around like she didn't give so she could get but it just so happens to work like that I mean well, what I- would you yeah. What would you say are some of the, the benefits or the outcomes, you know, we call the podcast ROG, which is return on generosity, like, and not again, not to give so that you get, but the fact is you do, you get so much in your experience. What are some of the returns that you've experienced? Uh, doesn't it just feel awesome? <laughs> it right. Yeah. And, and yes, that's, not necessarily why you always do it right you do it because you identify like a, you know a need but you know uh, for example like people who know somebody maybe it's their son it's their cousin it's whatever that's like he wants to be a navy seal and they feel like i'm going to be put out if they uh if they ask me to have a call with, with this young man or, or young women even and I'm always, I feel like, of course, if I can, cause I, I remember back when I just thirsted for that knowledge. Yeah. And I feel like it's like almost like it's an obligation. Like, I feel like, you know, sometimes people should have an obligation if they hold something that may be somewhat unique and, and being able to offer a service, like you should feel like that. And then when you do that, you should be able to say, you know what? Yeah, I, I did a good thing. And when, when that happens, you know, you feel like a level of motivation, right? And I feel like when you do that, like when you are in an environment where people do that, it's very energizing. Totally. And and again, it just, it creates bonds. It creates trust. Mm -hmm. And so at every opportunity where you can build those deeper roots within your network or within your team, then Mm -hmm. then lead that way. And it's a fundamental element of leadership is is, is being able to do for those people. Totally agree. And as much as we are responsible for our own path, our own, you know, sense of purpose, we can influence and support other people's sense of purpose. I know that's something you really believe. So by having conversations like you do with these individuals who are considering is going for the SEALs a part of my future or not, and they reach out to you for that advice, that's one way that you are influencing or helping them discern what might be the right path for them right and also it's you know i'll go back to when you know when when we fought i think we've talked about this before you know covid hits and like I've all the all, all my my paying gigs that were all in person they all dry dried up and and i hadn't really made the 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 really specific pivot to the virtual stuff right at that point uh and so I was really like, all right, well, what do I do? I mean, I'm retired. So it's like, I'm, I, I've got like, I've got some comfort. Right. But I, I'm not an, an immediate, I'm like very lucky compared to many people, but I still, I was like, I need to get that sense of purpose. And I think when you, w- when you look at like trying to help other people with that, it gives you that sense of purpose. And I think I do say like, you know, whether you read it, like Simon Sinek talks about the why uh, it's very important that you are that self-determination for your own sense of purpose, right? When, when morale seems to dip in organizations, when you start to face that doubt, when you start to kind of feel that uh, disillusionment kind of set in, a lot of times it's because you start to lose that sense of purpose. 
Mm. You know, even with when, when you work for a great organization, right? And you love your organization, it, it, you know, if we're being honest, we realize that we don't always love the direction that organization is going. You know, we don't always gel with every teammate or leader. And, and but we do have to have kind of that personal philosophy, mm. personal philosophy that says, uh, how do I want to show up in the world? How mm. do I want to be seen by others? What do yeah. I stand for? What am I about? Who am I? You know, we have to have that peace. And, and that's, we're responsible for that. And, and and once we have that, then it's again our, our obligation to help to, to realize that we we can form that that sense of purpose in other people, right? We right. can be that source of strength and that connection for them to say, you know what, I were I may not like this specific task, but I sure like the people that I work with right now because they're there for me. Yeah. Uh, you can really create, you know, be instrumental in, in in you know giving that way. For sure. Yes. And even if you're not totally jiving with the direction that say some of the senior leaders have taken or, you know, merging with another organization or whatever some of the complexities are that you're dealing with, that you can find the purpose in your leadership of other people or like in the modeling. I think some of the examples that you've shared already, Steve, are around how you show up, you know, how you influence people just by being who you are. I think that's a really important thing. So one of your life mottos that you've shared with me, if I, if I may share with, with those who are joining us is, I am a professional, I don't crumble when things get hard, and I exist to be of service. Can you tell us more about that? You know, I, I, one of the things we would teach Warrior Toughness, and, and I, I really, it was important for me to get a lot of the, you know, the young sailors, the, the, car, the part that I taught was, I taught the people that would teach the recruits. So it was almost like train the trainer kind of thing. These were the, the drill sergeants, right? The, or we call them the Navy recruit division commanders. And, and our training was, was for them to, to pass it on. And so I, I would always say, hey, it was really important for me to say, hey, develop a personal philosophy. Mm-hmm. The personal philosophy, that, these are the things that I just described a second ago, which, which was, you know, who am I? What do I stand for? Where, where do I want to go? And what am I willing to do to get there? And, and how do I want to be seen by others? And so I, I try to take that and I try to make it as very simple as possible. But I try to say, is an example that I think everybody can kind of kind of use, right? You know, I'm a professional, right? In, in a business sense, which means that I don't take things for granted. You know, whether I'm doing it's it's a high paid gig, or whether I, I'm going on somebody's show, or whether it's it's with a bunch of high school kids, I make sure that I dedicate the same level of preparation for any of those things Mm -hmm. to make sure, because that's just, that's because that's what I feel is important. That's what I feel like needs to be modeled. Right. So if you get me to, to, you put me in front of somebody, you'll know that I I will, I will give my very best. And, And, you know, I also make it clear that I continue to work at the type of rehearsal, the type of emotional regulation, mindfulness training that enables me to, and I, again, when, when you got teenage kids, right, it, it easier said than done sometimes, right? Uh, I acknowledge that I, that I, that I fall short sometimes, right? Uh, but I try to endeavor to have those type of skills that when things start to stress me, uh, somebody says something that, that angers me, that I'm able to respond in a meaningful way, as opposed to just react with what the emotions when they take over, right? And lastly, uh, I have to have that sense of purpose when all else fails, whether I'm getting paid or not, I want to ch- I choose to walk away with the fact that I, I exist to provide value. I exist to provide service. Yeah. Uh, and when I look in the mirror, I can be satisfied with who yeah. I am. Oh my gosh. That's so great for all of us to consider how well we can answer those questions and good guiding principles to help us to prioritize things in our life and, get clear about, you know, what would enable me to stay strong and not crumble? And how could I be even more professional than I am right now? And then that dedication to service, like always finding a way to make a contribution. And your willingness to go to the furthest degree that I think that any human would ever be asked to go to is the willingness to sacrifice your own life for others. So what would you say, what would you say about that? I mean, when you're, you have been in near death situations and I'm sure you have unpacked that at some point, right? Like, what would you say gets you through those moments? Like, how do you, how, you know, you're, you're a, an educator and a coach of mental toughness. You're, you speak to all levels of people and how to 
equip them for those um, high stake moments. So, you know, your willingness to really put everything you have on the line for the mission is something that most of us can't really comprehend. So what could you teach us about that, Steve? Well, there's, you know, in the SEAL teams, like you would imagine any branch of service, we got our, uh, a ton of expressions, right? A, a ton of little nuggets. And one of them is, you know, when, when the bullets are flying, you won't magically rise to the occasion and do great things. You're going to fall instead to your level of training. You're going to fall to your level of preparation. When you arrive at the SEAL teams, you've already been tested. Your level of commitment in terms of are you willing to, to do what the person to the left and right of you might not be willing to do mm-hmm. in terms of like when, when you're cold, when you're tired, when you're hungry, and that person can't take any more, you're committed to keep going. Mm-hmm. And then you're committed to put the needs of, of the boat crew, of the team, of the mission above your own personal sense of suffering. And if you're not willing to do that, you'll never make it to the SEAL teams. And, and once you're there, you've already kind of acknowledged that that's what you are and, and, and who you are and, and what you're willing to do. And so when you're outside of a door and you walk through that door, knowing that you could be shot, your, feel, your fear of failure, your, your, your fear of being thought a coward, uh, of, of coming up short, it actually is that supersedes the fear for your own personal safety. Mm. And so that's just how you're conditioned uh, at that point. Uh, but in terms of like for business, when we have to, to perform on those X's, right? Me walking through the door, right? That's combat. But, you know, one of the connections I try to make is that's there's everybody has their own like on that X moment, right? And, and yes. to, to varying degrees of seriousness. And, and if you want to show up that day and be able to prepare all that stuff takes, you know, is formed well in advance of that moment. Mm -hmm. And you have to be committed in the training and the skills. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have to make sure you sharpen that mental game. Mm -hmm. But so when you're, you're, you're situationally aware, you're able to kind of quiet those fears a little bit. So you can think critically uh, and make composed decisions. And and that starts with a process that doesn't just happen by itself. Maybe for some people it's easier, but if you really want to perform in those moments then you've got to put the work in. Yes. Yeah. Because you'll be reduced to your level of training or preparation you're saying, because nobody's just going to rise to the occasion and be mentally tough, present, um, as focused as they could be, but that, but the preparation and the understanding that we're going to be in this high pressure situation at varying degrees. And how can I, think in advance about how I might react and how I, like who I want to be. And that's another thing I keep hearing you say, Steve, is that it starts with you being clear in advance of how you want to be, like how, how you want to impact the situation or the kind of, you know, seal you want to be, or the kind of leader you want to be, the kind of dad, the kind of friend, the, all of the different roles that we have in our lives. Like you think about that ahead of time and then you say, okay, so what would I need to do to be prepared when that's not an easy way to be <laughs> like, like being patient as a dad, for example, it's like not an easy thing to do with teenagers or with anyone. So you have to think, okay, so when I'm getting triggered, how will I react in a way that's more in sync with what I decided I'm going to be? Yes, exactly. And as a professional, you know, very often people can get by to a certain degree on talent. But when things go sideways, when things go off that script, then you find out who people really are, right? Somebody who's, uh, who looks like they're a fairly good speaker and all of a sudden their slides don't come up in the middle of a big keynote, like how how well have they prepared how well are they able to, to pivot and just start delivering while the the tech's in the back of the room and anybody who's probably done that any level of time, uh, myself included has had, you know, yeah. tech issues. Your slides don't show up. Well, okay. The real professional doesn't skip a beat. They keep delivering. Mm-hmm. And then, they, yes. you know, slides come back up or they don't come back up, right? But it doesn't yes. matter. You keep dropping on. Uh, and that's how you find out, like, the, the real professionals, the elite units in the military, the ones 
that practice how to do it right. They know what it looks like when it's done right, but they spent so much time about how to build contingencies, how to pivot, how to be flexible uh, and agile. Yes, brilliant. So if you could give everybody a word of wisdom, uh, something, maybe a nugget, another nugget, you've given us so many today, but that you could say, if I could wish you know, this for everyone, or here's something I've learned that I want everybody to know, what, what's a parting word you could give us, Steve? I would say that after you, you've put all the work in, you've, you've trained, you've prepared, and you're conducting business, I would say, you, you know, as a leader, as an individual, never miss an opportunity to demonstrate humility, I think is, is what one I always like, like to share. Yeah. Yes. Never miss an opportunity to demonstrate humility. Well, thank you for the example of Neil Robert. I think that's an awesome legacy for all of us to be inspired by. Your legacy is one to be inspired by, Steve. And tell us where we can find you. Uh, my, my, my company is called Breaching Leadership, but you can find me, uh, Steve, at stephendrum.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-D-R-U-M. Yeah. Uh, uh, reach You're out. You're commonly known as Drummy to us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Steve at stephendrum.com. And just one curiosity question before we close is Breaching Leadership. Tell me why you named your organization that. I, a friend of mine actually helped me c come up with that right and, and uh, we were discussing you know breaching is your method of going through it you know a method of entry right whether it's uh, as, as a seal tactical element you're trying to gain access to a structure or a compound and you're breaching a wall you're breaching a door you're getting through with explosives mechanical tools uh manual tools whatever that is a door kick right you breach that and as you go through right you're on that x you got to get in there and how do you perform when you find yourself right in that X at that breach point. Right. So in a lot of things, I, I like to try to be, to help influence new emerging leaders or, or identified uh, potential leaders within an organization. Yeah. And I feel like they're thrust into this position when they're breaching that first opportunity of leadership. Have we effectively set them up to, to succeed? Or, or have we failed to give them the training they need and they look for an exit sign, so. Yeah. Oh my gosh, love it. I'm glad I asked, because I, I think it's a cool name. I just didn't know what led you to it. It's perfect for what you do. Thank you. Helping people stand strong on that X. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Steve. It's been such a gift to connect with you. Thank you, Shannon. It was fun. I, I had a great time. So it's great, great seeing you, great talking to you.